afternoon. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum. Thank you for joining us for Spy Chat. I hope you're here again, or if it's your first time, welcome. We're, we're really glad to be able to offer such an interesting conversation to you when we'd all rather be out and about leading our, our past and future lives. But we have a really interesting discussion lined up for you today. Um, our speakers are going to each present about topics that they're finding, you know, really stimulating, really engaging, even worrisome. Um, and then they'll be answering your questions. Uh, so a little bit of detail. First of all, you'll somewhere on your screen, whatever you're on, you'll see a question mark. And that's how you can type in your question. And we'll be seeing those and I'll be conveying them to our speakers. Um, I also want you to know that just like in an in-person program, unfortunately, not every question will get answered, but we'll do our best and we may be able to follow up later uh, with some answers. Um, also, uh, as we like to say, we can't IT you. There's so many different platforms people are joining from tablets, from phones, from PCs and laptops, um, but we do have some tips for you. If you're having trouble, please refresh. Uh, if you own, can only see one of us and you really don't want to see me, you can uh, swipe left or right if you're on a tablet or a phone, and that can really work well for you. So I think that gets rid of, oh, one more thing. We can't control the construction that might be happening outside. We'll try to mute our mics if something happens. But as you know, we're broadcasting from home. So thanks for your uh, kind consideration of, of some of those issues. All right, without further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, who is my super cool boss, Chris Costa. He's the executive director of the International Spy Museum. He had a pretty exciting career that you can read about in the program description online, but I do wanna say he was most recently with the National Security Council, so he really knows what he's talking about. And Chris is gonna give us his thoughts on truly hot topics. And he might even give us some suggestions for things to read that might um, distract us or engage us. So thanks so much, Chris. Hey, thank you for that great introduction, Amanda. No one's ever called me super cool. Thank you everyone for supporting Spy Chat that we're holding virtually. This is the second time that we've done our program online. Though the physical spy museum is currently closed, I promise you we will reopen. I just can't tell you when, but our team is consistently in working on our virtual programs and continuing our education mission. I'm very proud of them. I also, before we get started, I wanna extend my warmest wishes for everyone to stay healthy and well. Without further ado, let me just jump into the first article that interests me. We're the International Spy Museum. I know a little bit about the Israeli intelligence services, in particular, Israel's Mossad. I think all of us have heard about the Mossad. What's interesting, as a result of the pandemic, the Mossad has switched gears a little bit, and they're currently getting into the logistics of going out worldwide and finding ventilators and other equipment that supports Israel's health needs. And you might be wondering, why would they be doing that? One, that's what the prime minister wants. They serve the state. And two, although they're not experts on logistics, the Mossad, they have networks and relationships across the globe. So the state needs those ventilators. The state needs uh, some additional support to their healthcare system. So that's what the Mossad is doing. Transitioning it a little bit to the, our CIA, the United States Central Intelligence Agency, in our intelligence community, the Washington Post and New York Times ha have put out pieces recently on the fact that we are redoubling, the United States is redoubling their efforts to understand what's happening on the ground in China to make sure the numbers are accurate, reported appropriately, what is happening as it relates to the coronavirus. And I think some of that is evening out, but certainly it informs the president on some of the decisions that he has to make, some of the analytical judgments. The next issue is related to China, but it has nothing to do with the pandemic. In fact, it's a counterintelligence story. 
It's the idea that there are a good deal of Chinese counter espionage, uh, or I'm sorry, there's a good deal of Chinese espionage work. As such, our FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation here in the United States, along with the Department of Justice, is being very, very aggressive on China because they are very adept at stealing intellectual property. And under a thin veneer of scientific research, there are some Americans that are working with the Chinese and might be violating espionage acts. As such, uh, the Department of Justice is really focused very much on those cases across the country. Switching gears a little bit to terrorism, a very, very important terrorism story. You may have seen it or you may have missed it. It's about a terrorist label of white supremacists. For the first time, the United States has called a white supremacist organization a foreign terrorist. The organization is called Russian Imperial Movement. They operate out of Russia. It is, a, as I said, a, a white separatist, or I'm sorry, supremacist organization. Uh, it runs some camps in Russia. It trains people to go off and fight in places like the Ukraine. So sanctions are going to be levied against it by the United States. And I think this is a very important terrorist uh, story as it relates to the United States and some of our policy, the United States policy initiatives. Also, sadly, in the middle of a coronavirus in southern France, I was tracking last week, there was a knifing attack by a terrorist. It's being reported he was a terrorist and being investigated about by uh, terrorist prosecutors in the, uh, the southern portion of France. Fortunately, since the town was shut down, the police were very quickly able to arrest this terrorist who had killed two individuals and wounded tragically five. So that's a reminder that in the middle of a pandemic, terrorism stories do not go away. Another story on terrorism, I want to take you back to 2002, a terrible tra tragedy as it related to a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, a very very good reporter. Um, his name was Daniel Pearl. He traveled to Pakistan to follow leads. He was lured into a location. It was a ruse, and he was murdered brutally by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Two weeks ago, four of the individuals that were complicit in his kidnapping in Pakistan were released inexplicably by the Pakistani justice system. Within 24 hours, there was an outcry and the Pakistanis rearrested the four individuals. One of them, I believe, is waiting on death row for participating in that kidnapping. It was a tragic story that played out, as I said, in 2002. Uh, the, the final two stories, just to provoke some thinking, one of them was uh, placed in foreign affairs and it's this idea that when the pandemic is over, what are the lasting impact on the intelligence community, on the society as we know it, on the world? And it's a, it was a thought piece that talked about this idea that China, for example, not to pick on them, other countries as well, using digital surveillance as well as artificial intelligence to track their population. What does this mean in Western liberal democracies? Are we going to use iPhones to track people, to enforce social distancing? It is an interesting question, and I certainly don't have the answers, but maybe some of you will have some follow-on questions. In the last piece, I talked about it uh, the last time we did spy chat. There are some ceasefires that are playing out across the world, but in war zones, while health workers continue in places like Libya to very much, uh, they're very much worried about uh, the health implications of this virus on uh, civilians, children, young adults. There's also combat breaking out in places like Libya. In Afghanistan, there's an exploitation of that by terrorist organizations like ISIS in Afghanistan. There is some silver lining in places like Yemen. Uh, there is a ceasefire while health workers are able to treat people that are dealing with the coronavirus. So I guess the point being, 
wars aren't ending because of the coronavirus, except for in some isolated places in the world where we've seen some ceasefires. So that and those are a few of the issues I wanted to talk about and pose to you. So when we get to questions, maybe I can follow up. Thank you very much. Back to Amanda. Oh, I'm sorry, one follow on. So what am I reading? Amanda asked me to share with you a book that I'm reading, rereading actually, is called Anonymous Soldiers by Dr. Bruce Hoffman, an expert on terrorism. He wrote about the uh, Palestine in the 1940s, really a, a 30 year epic story on terrorism, counter terrorism, on insurgency, counter insurgency, and then the creation of the state. So that is a book I strongly recommend you might pick up and read. Thank you. Amanda? Great. Thank you, Chris, so much. And and Steve, who's been sitting there, <laughs> thank you for that, for your patience. I know you were going to key off of some of the things that Chris had to say. Stephen uh, A. Cash is an advisory board member at the Spy Museum. He's our outside general counsel. Thank you for being a lawyer that we can really get help from that we may not always want to have to get <laughs> help from. Um, you have had an interesting background. Um, one of your many roles, you were a liaison between uh, intelligence officers or the intelligence community and science uh, community. So I think that might be particularly drawn upon today as everyone is so concerned about the pandemic, but I know you have many broader interests, so I will turn it over to you to talk for a little bit. Thanks, Steve, so much. Well, first, thank you for having me, and it's it's just, it's wonderful to be, uh, it's always wonderful to be a part of the Spy Museum. I, I love being on the advisory panel. I love being your, your lawyer, and I love being here on Spy Chat, and hope to talk about a few of the things that Chris raised first, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about my background so you, you know where I'm coming from here. I, yes, I am a lawyer, even though I'm not wearing a tie today. They let us take it off during the pandemic. Um, I began my career as a prosecutor up in New York. If you watch Law & Order, that's my old office. Um, but then joined the Central Intelligence Agency first as a lawyer and then decided I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore and became an intelligence uh, officer in, on the operations side and worked on counterterrorism and, and other matters. Um, since then, I've done a lot of work, um, sort of in the area where it straddles science, biology, and the intelligence community, and that's what I, th I think we really want to talk about today. Um, we're all sitting at home. We're, we're all worrying about coronavirus, and we're all reading in the newspapers as our national leadership tries to make decisions. And this is both a great uh, moment to sort of think about what the intelligence community does, what intelligence does uh, in the general sense, and also what it's doing in the area of coronavirus, which sounds a little strange when we think about intelligence collection and analysis. Uh, I, I hope after all the spy chats, we think about more than James Bond, but we don't think about biology often. Um, but let me sort of step back for just a second and, and, and talk a little bit about what the intelligence community does. I'm a former agency, so I think about it from their uh, their optic, which is human intelligence, uh, recruiting spies, um, but there are a whole bunch of other agencies, the National Security Agency, for instance, that does signals intelligence. But what are they collecting against, and what do we mean by foreign intelligence? And you'll see how this links back to um, to coronavirus. Um, basically, uh, our leadership has to make decisions, and those decisions are hopefully linked to what the reality of the world is. Now, a lot of what's happening in the world, we can understand and know with a high degree of certainty by basically looking at our window or reading the newspaper. But there is a lot of the world and a very important part of the world, which is obscure. It, it can't be easily seen. It's not out in the open. Now, when we think about intelligence, I mean, here's the obvious one. Our adversaries overseas uh, have weapon systems and they keep them secret. We don't know necessarily how fast their planes go or how big their guns on their tanks are. And we don't know when and under what circumstances they would have a war or not have a war and whether they'll sign this treaty and whether or not they will insist on some diplomatic initiative. So there's reality out there 
which is obscure to our leaders. And if you ever played poker or bought a house, you can imagine, or bought a car, you, there's information you don't know, but you'd like to know. What is, what did my adversary hold in their hand? Or what is the car dealer really gonna sell this car for? Does this house have termites? Um, all that stuff isn't known to you. Um, well, the intelligence community is in the business of pulling back the curtain, or at least, at least looking behind the curtain, and observing and reporting on what reality is. And historically, a lot of that has focused on the traditional collection missions. And I'll throw out some terminology here. The requirements of the consumers, two words there that don't necessarily fit with James Bond. What, who are the consumers? They're the people who have to make the decisions. That's the president and uh, combatant commanders, uh, cabinet secretaries, the Congress, um, state and local officials in charge of Homeland Security. They're the people who have to make decisions and they want them informed by that obscured reality. Um, and their requirements are what they need. Um, think about ordering in a restaurant. Your requirements are, I need a hamburger, they bring you a hamburger. Uh, the president needs to know X, Y, or Z. The intelligence community tries to bring it to the president or to the secretary of defense. Um, normally, and in most cases, the bulk of what the requirements are revolve around things like military intelligence or political intelligence. What is Putin thinking? What is the president of whatever country thinking? What is he going to do or she going to do? when confronted with this, this situation. But medicine and public health has been a part of that, although it's relatively small part of that. Certainly for many years, uh, we've always been interested in um, man-made public health issues. Does a given country have a biological weapons program? Where did that anthrax come from? Are terrorist groups preparing to attack us using biological weapons? Uh, we want to know about the plans, intentions, and capabilities of our adversaries. Do they know how to make a bioweapon? If they do know how to make a bioweapon, when and under what circumstances, and even if, they would use it. And that's what spies do. That's what intelligence collection does. They try to find out the answers to those questions, bring them back to Washington, let our decision makers make decisions based on that information. Um, some aspect has involved uh, natural medical and public health issues. Why would that be? You would think that you know you could go to Johns Hopkins up in Baltimore or to the Mayo Institute in, out, out in the Midwest or to the National Institute of Health. You can call up Dr. Fauci and ask him about viruses. Um, we know a lot about how the natural world works. What we often don't know is how is it working overseas? Now, sometimes that's obvious. You know, there's a, uh, an epidemic of measles in Paris. You could probably call up the Paris uh, health officials and they'll tell you about the measles. So we have a pretty good insight into that. It's like looking out your window. But in some countries and at some times and in some places, um, for a host of reasons, public health information like how fast tanks go or how fast an airplane goes is obscured uh, either deliberately Sometimes it's obscure unintentionally. There's some nations that just simply don't have the ability to uh, gather and understand their own public health data, particularly in the developing world. And in some other countries, the government has a, an interest and an ability to control that information. I'm thinking of China here. How many people really did have coronavirus? When did they have coronavirus? Did the Chinese know something about the transmissibility and the mechanisms of transmissibility? Can we trust what the, uh, the Chinese are telling us? Um, at one point, we heard that the Chinese were being completely transparent or, with us, at least publicly. They, they were telling us everything. Is that true? And we ask our intelligence community to do sort of two things. Um, is what we're seeing real? Is it... Uh, a true representation of reality? And if it's not, can you find out what it is? What really is happening? How many people really died? Where was the uh, uh, epidemic uh, most virulent? Um, were there patterns that are being concealed? Do they really have it under control? And all of that comes back to our decision makers 
it's analyzed, it's synthesized with other information we have. Um, we have a tremendous amount of expertise here in the United States that can add to what our collectors collect overseas and come up with an analytic product that can really help our decision makers come to the best decisions possible. And in the area of pandemic, and we're seeing it right now, um, you, can go on, you can turn on the TV pretty much any afternoon and you can read and see as we try to make decisions. What is the course of this disease? Is what we're hearing from the Germans, from the, from the Chinese, from the Iranians, is it accurate? What is the effect on those countries? Is it gonna destabilize those countries? Chris mentioned we have a ceasefire in Yemen, but we don't have a ceasefire in Libya. Why is that? Um, is the evolution of this public health issue also affecting military and political and economic issues? And all around the world, the intelligence community is trying to get the answers to those questions and bring back an understanding for the uh, for, for the consumers of what reality is. I want to say a couple more words, and then I think we can start bouncing back and forth here and getting some questions going. Um, but you know, I've I've been talking about something, and what some people here already know these term this terminology. But in the intelligence community, we love jargon. We particularly love jargon that involves initials. So I'll give you some. So what I've been talking about is called FI, foreign intelligence. It's the information that is gathered about the plans, intentions, and capabilities of our foreign adversaries. It's observing the world and reporting back. You often hear also about something else, CA, covert action. That's when we use our intelligence entities to affect things overseas with the hand of the United States hidden where we're trying to change events on the ground as opposed to observe them. And our foreign adversaries do that as well. The Russians call it uh, active measures. Uh, you've probably heard a little bit about that. Uh, the uh, Russian involvement in our elections is a classic active measure. It's their version of covert action. Um, they're often combined. Uh, we all, we, it's really hard to affect things overseas if you don't know anything about them. So often you link foreign intelligence to covert action. Um, both are tools that in the United States are carefully uh, bounded by law and oversight. And that's an important thing. And I sort of want to leave people with that as we compare ourselves to other nations and their intelligence organizations. Uh, I've, I've often said that having an efficient and excellent intelligence uh, entity and a liberal effective democracy at the same time is the hardest trick in the book. Um, we have some really, really good tradecraft in the United States intelligence community. We're pretty good at what we do, um, but I've always thought that the best piece of tradecraft that the United States can be proud of is that we are able to do this and still have a democracy. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Um, we, we write laws to govern our intelligence organizations. We have oversight of our intelligence organizations, both from Congress, from our inspectors general, from other elements of the in, in, in intelligence community, both inside and out. Um, and I also leave you this. One reason I was so proud to be involved with the Spy Museum is because one element of oversight, in other words, the, the trade craft that America uses involves all of you. Because an educated and understanding population of citizens are much, much better able to make sure their intelligence organizations are not the Stasi and are not the Gestapo and are not the KGB. Um, and by you all participating in this, and hopefully when we reopen, coming to the actual museum, um, it helps us pull off that toughest of intelligence tricks, uh, which is doing it right and doing it in a democracy. So let me stop there and uh, toss it back to, to Chris and Amanda and, and see where we go. Wow, that was... Both of you are amazingly informative and a lot of connections. We're, we're seeing uh, really cool questions coming in from our audience. Uh, lots of them are, of course, about the coronavirus. So there are other questions, but I thought maybe we'll, we'll start there. Um, many people are, there are different reports about this virus, and I'm going to lump a couple of questions together. Um, we talked about this last week on a program where intelligence analysts were looking 
at the pandemic. Um, it's a report that um, the virus didn't originate in the wet market in uh, Wuhan, China, but actually was um, a la some lab work that had gone wrong and gone astray. So there's that report and then that question combined with someone else um, who's asking about reports that both the US and China were experimenting with the coronavirus and from 2015, this mentions, the question mentions that, and that um, we stopped, but they continue. And I guess we should also remind everybody, a uh, common cold is a coronavirus, right? So um, anyway, just to, I'll, I'll hand it over to you all as the experts, but uh, every coronavirus is not terrifying, right guys? It's true. Chris, you want me to take that? Steve, why don't so, you take that and I'll follow up. Sure. Let, so let me talk about the two things you said, because they're, they're, they're really in front of mind and they're also illustrative. So yes, there are reports. So one, we have to be careful about reports. There are reports about pretty much everything. Um, I can find reports that will talk about the aliens coming. Um, and that happens in the intelligence community as well. Um, collectors obtain information. Some of that information is not good and some of it's false. It could be false, and I think Chris may talk a little bit about disinformation or misinformation. It be, can be false because your source is just wrong, not from any malintent, because they're just not very smart or not very observant, or they just don't know. Um, and that happens, obviously, outside the intelligence community. What is it that we know? Now, what you're talking about is a State Department cable that speaks to a lab in the Wuhan area that had significant safety concerns. Now, let me, I'm gonna to skip to your second question because it will, it, it links. So every, almost every developed nation has an extensive uh, program of research into dangerous biologicals. Why? Because that's how they come up with vaccines. That's how the medical establishment figures out how to cure the diseases. So, um, and a number of them, if you're in the Washington area, um, there are a number of them here run by private industry, run by universities, run by the government. Um, because what they work on is often dangerous and has nothing to do with defense or biological weapons, it's just simply dangerous. Um, they work in specialized labs. Um, they are, those labs are rated BSL-3 and BSL-2, which tells you how secure they are. Um, there are a couple of them right around the Washington area. Um, it is very difficult to, to run labs effectively and safely. Uh, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of expertise. Um, both the, for instance, historically, the Russians had an extensive government-run laboratory program. It, it, it scared the bejesus out of us for a long time as the Soviet Union fell because they didn't have any money to keep them up and they became very dangerous. We've also seen issues like that in China. Um, are they working on coronavirus? Um, the, the class of viruses that make up a, an array of diseases are a high priority for uh, research facilities all over the world. Yes, lots of people are working on coronavirus before there was a pandemic, and even more are working on coronavirus right now. That's how they're gonna get a vaccine. Um, and the places where they're working on those vaccines are very difficult. Let me end by saying, to the extent that there have been rumors going around that, for instance, that State Department cable is evidence that we've been sort of attacked by the, uh, by the Chinese. Um, I don't think there's any, at least I don't have access to the current intelligence, but I don't see any indication of that. It is an example of where the collected information gets synthesized with the, the world outside the intelligence community, because there's been a tremendous amount of work done on the gene sequencing, the sequencing and the identification of Corona-19. And I believe, from what I last read, that the expertise largely uh, residing in the Department of Defense and in academia are, have a high degree of confidence that it was not generated by human intervention. Now, does that mean it hadn't been isolated and that somebody in a lab or many labs were trying to figure out what is this new thing? We just got it from a, uh, from a patient or from an animal we haven't seen it before, figure out what it is. Those of you who took chemistry, you can remember, you got the Petri dish and all that stuff. Um, 
what is it? How does it work? How do we cure it? Is it dangerous? Um, is it going to expand? That's happening all the time, all over the world. So, Chris, yeah, you want thanks, Steve. And now everybody knows why Steve joined us today. We're really lucky to have him. I will just add this, and Steve knew I would mention active disinformation. HIV, it was reported, was a experiment that went poorly in a U.S. Army lab somewhere in Maryland. That turned out to be, and we talk about this at the Spy Museum, that turned out to be active measures, which Steve already talked about. It was a disinformation campaign that started with the Russians. So step back and talk about the pandemic. We now know, and it's been reported, that China, Iran, and Russia have all contributed to disinformation deliberately to undermine our efforts in the Americans' confidence in their own institutions. Uh, that includes um, all the work that's been done to uh, get a handle on the pandemic here in the United States and the CDC. So our adversaries in this information domain are going to continue to pick at that and take advantage of some of our vulnerabilities. We have a polarized society. Without going any further, that advantages those who want to take advantage of disinformation. But it's all a part of what Steve talked about, of active measures. It's gone on for decades and decades from the Cold War through the present day. And the last point I will make, at the museum we talk about analytical tradecraft and you hear from analysts in their own words. Analysts are trained to sift through all of the reporting and they are very weary, wary, I should say, of disinformation. So I have confidence that the analysts will provide the right right uh, uh, analysis to our decision makers. I'll, I'll pause I just there. want to add one. I want to add one thing. If, if you're on the, if you're listening to this this webcast and you're coming to our museum, or you're just a citizen, particularly in times like this, uh, we don't expect you to join the CIA and become an analyst, but you sort of have an obligation as a citizen to pick up some of that analytic tradecraft. So if you're reading about the story about there's a lab in, in China, do what an analyst would do, what a CIA analyst or a DIA analyst would do. What's the sourcing? Is it corroborated? Does it make sense? Does it match with other information that I have? How can I verify it? Where else can I read? Um, if you're looking at one television station and they say something, put on another television. Do they say the same thing? Um, who said it? What's the source? Can I read original documents? You, you don't have to be a CIA intel officer to do you know, basic good analytic tradecraft. And I think there's no time, at least in my lifetime, where it's been so important that uh, regular people, American citizens, in order to carry out your duties as a citizen, have to act like analysts. So you know, I hope you're picking up some of the tradecraft. You don't have to pick up the collection tradecraft. You don't need to do dead drops. But you got to start thinking like a like an intel analyst. Well, that's interesting. It was really one of our questions. Where can people? And we'll get back um, to the virus talk. But um, where are there other suggestions for where people can go? You're saying check two TV stations. Um, are there websites? Are there news sources that you? Feel, I mean, we we all know there's bias, there's liberal bias, conservative bias, but anything that you two particularly trust that seems to do common ground, I sometimes look at foreign news sources to see, you know, kind of get their perspective on our country. Now, if I can jump in, I'll take that one. And Steve alluded to it. It's multiple sources. I go to Al Jazeera, and during the 2000s, we we thought Al Jazeera was uh, collaborating to some extent with jihadists on the ground in Iraq because they always seemed to arrive at the point where Americans would be killed by an IED. Whether that's fair or unfair, I don't know truth um, insofar as Al Jazeera, but I can tell you, I think it's extremely valuable to understand the viewpoints of Al Jazeera, to see how they report events through their lens. So Steve makes the point 
go to multiple sources, go to multiple news outlets. Don't consistently go to the same news outlet. Don't consistently go to the same social media site. You've got to go to multiple sources and you have to question some of your own assumptions. So Steve's point is exactly right. We have a smart nation. In fact, anybody tuning in today um, are, are, are comfortable with educating themselves. They're interesting and interested in hearing other people's stories. So question what you see, uh, question the assumptions, go to multiple sources, and I think those recommendations will serve everyone well. Let me just add to that, and I'm, I'm gonna keep harkening back to sort of the, the in intelligence community analytic tradecraft um, without giving anything classified away. I'm going to, you know, illustrate what I, some advice based on what an Intel officer would do. Um, first thing, uh, if you look at it, uh, many Intel reports, you'll see what's called the source byline. Uh, that's a description of the source of the information, uh, and that's what it's called on in, in the Intel world. Um, in in your life, it's it's called the writer's byline. It's at the top of the news article, um, or it's the station identification of the television station, or it's the author of the book you're reading, or the biography of the person you're listening to. Um, I hope some of the people here are curious enough to, you know, if you're meeting us for the first time, it, go look up Chris, go look up me and see who I am. Do you trust me? Um, I hope you do, uh, but don't just look at me on the screen and decide you trust me. Look me up, check my source byline. Has what I said been uh, true in the past? Is there bias? If there is bias, can you accept that? Second is corroboration, corroboration, corroboration. All Intel analysts do it. They read a report from source X and they know there's source Y who reports on the same area. Do they match? Is there a difference? Why is there a difference? So having multiple perspectives, being able to do the corroboration or the non-corroboration is an essential element of what an Intel analyst does every day in their life. Um, now, there are some good sources you can go to for certain things. Um, when people start talking about, for instance, internally, this is how the Constitution, well, here's, here's a perfect one. The Constitution says X or Y. Well, go read the Constitution. It's online. It's a short document. It's fairly easy to read. Um, the Congressional Research Service puts out a whole bunch of really authoritative reports um, on almost every issue. Um, so if you're reading about uh, and I'm going to focus on the intelligence issues, if you're reading about who has security clearances or you're reading about what does it mean that uh, information is classified, well, you can, you can, there's an executive order which describes classification. It's available online. If somebody tells you that the executive order says X, you can read it. Uh, that's source co corroboration. If they were telling you something untrue, that will affect your evaluation of that source. So, the internet's a wonderful thing. There's a lot you can do. It can take you down some rabbit holes and it's also a great source of disinformation because there's basically no transaction cost to put up anything you want. But um, it also lets you read original documents and, and authoritative documents basically for free and without ever leaving your house, which of course, since we can't, sort of important. Um, well, so we've talked about media, we've talked about media manipulation, disinformation. Um, here's, a, here's a scary question that we've discussed before. Um, it, how likely is it that terrorists might take advantage of the situation um, that our country or other countries find themselves in right now with the pandemic? We're so focused on that. Chris, we've talked about this a lot. We're so focused on the, uh, on the coronavirus. Um, what can happen? when we're looking the other way. So I can jump in there. And we said this a couple of weeks ago, and I'll reinforce the point. Terrorists already are taking advantage of seams, in particular ISIS in Afghanistan. Uh, while there are possibilities for true productions, withdrawal of U.S. forces, it, while we negotiate for for trading of uh, captives between the Afghan government and the Taliban, 
ISIS is taking advantage of the coronavirus and taking advantage of those seams to exploit vulnerabilities right now on the ground in Afghanistan. Similarly, that's happening in West Africa. Uh, just remember, while we're very much concerned about the, the coronavirus and this pandemic, this plays into narratives of some extremists like ISIS. Again, they take advantage of this and suggest that this is apocalyptic, meaning this is an approach to the end of times. So operators who are out there, terrorists, are supposed to act. People that uh, are, are considering what to do, take action now. Those are the kinds of tropes, those are the kinds of messaging that's playing out in dark corners of the internet. Again, as Steve pointed out, the internet is wonderful, but it's double-edged too. There's a, a very negative implication of people conversing online in the dark web and, and elsewhere. But uh, the bottom line is, I think terrorism is a disease that will not go away. It can only be arrested. It'll ebb and flow, and I've talked about that as well. So I think our, our analysts across the uh, counterintelligence enterprise, uh, to include with our foreign partners, are very, very aware and circumspect of the possibility that terrorists will take advantage of this. So I have confidence that they're watching the, this, this language play out, watching the rhetoric, paying attention to the possibility for some attack planning. I think that's right. I think there, there's, you know, terrorists, to, to some extent, if you're thinking about we're focused on, pan, on pandemic and therefore we're not paying attention to the guns, guards, and gates, I think that's less of an issue. Um, uh, the ability to attack us is probably not one of the major ones. Um, what I do think terrorists are looking at here is the perception that our uh, relationship with our allies is fraying, that there's distrust between the allies, that it, they're uh, assessing that it's increasingly likely that there would, would not be a cooperative response between the traditional um, countries that work against terrorism together. Um, and I, I'm my guess is that they're looking very closely at what's happening to the, particularly the transatlantic alliances and how they can take advantage of what they probably perceive as a breakdown in the, in the, uh, in the, in the camaraderie of the traditional allies against terrorism. Um, this is a really um, very specific and interesting question. Um, directed to you, Steve, about your work with um, BSEG and other entities, and um, mentioning that some developing countries, it may be hard to get a handle, either because they don't even know themselves what's going on, or they're potentially obscuring it. Um, and this questioner is wondering if there anybody puts boots on the ground to go and work with those governments um, to help them or also to find out exactly what's going on. I thought that was pretty interesting. So question. you mentioned BSEG, the BSEG. Uh, I don't, most people probably don't know what that is. The Biosciences Experts Group is a, a DNI sponsored uh, outside advisory panel uh, that helps the intelligence community with issues related to the biosciences. It's mostly made up of scientists. I served on it uh, for, I guess, five or six years. I'm not a scientist. I was the only non-scientist there, so I got to pretend. Um, and I was sort of the, the, the go-between between, between uh, intelligence officers and the scientists. You're exactly right. Uh, the, they're, particularly in the developing world, uh, often in sub-Saharan Africa, um, where one, we have for a lot of uh, uh, disease vectors, we have huge reservoirs because a lot of our diseases come out of nat natural wildlife. Um, particularly things like bats, they, there are a lot of them in, in Africa. Because Africa is the least developed of, of large areas of the world, there's a tremendous am amount of that and a, a much poorer healthcare system. Um, boots on the ground, uh, they've decreased significantly. Um, there's been a tremendous push against, for instance, uh, to, to cut back on uh, foreign aid, uh, things like Peace Corps, uh, USAID um, and foreign aid that sends people to, to to there. We have much. We made a decision to have less of that. Um, 
people are often asking, what do we get for our foreign aid? And one of the things in this particular context that illustrates it is, yes, U.S. tax dollars go to pay for you know a couple of scientists to go to uh, the to Democratic Republic of Congo to visit healthcare facilities. That's not just a gift. We get something back, and what we get back is boots on the ground who are looking at those healthcare facilities. They are problematic, particularly in the in the more impoverished countries. I remember being at a BSEG meeting where somebody did a slideshow. I can't remember what Central African country it was, and we were going to. They visited one of their bio labs, and we we're looking at the picture, and it was sort of hard to figure out what it was. And somebody said, "Is that a dead horse on the floor?" And it was. They had like a dead horse on the floor. And we said, like, why is there a dead horse on the floor? And we, at the same time, we noticed that there are no windows in this facility. Um, and they said, well, they don't, have the, they don't have the money to pay the staff. The horse had been, uh, exper you know, basically uh, they did an autopsy, but they don't have the guy to get rid of the horse for a while. So the horse is gonna be there. Um, these are these are countries where there's not enough money and resources to give basic medical care to children. So it's rare that there's the kind of resources to you know, make sure things don't uh, escape from a lab or that whatever killed that horse is not getting into people. Um, you would not see that in a less impoverished co country. People have the money to be safer. I'll, I'll give you one other uh, anecdote of that, well, as the Soviet Union fell, we were very concerned about um, certain labs uh, in, in Russia, and, and, and there were reports that not only had all the sort of the protocols fell apart, but that, that lab staff were basically eating the rats because they weren't getting paid, and they were in the middle of nowhere, and there was no food coming. Um, so if you don't have money and the, the, you know, the lock on the rat cage breaks, you don't fix it, um, just you can't fix it. So yeah, that's a real concern. If you're in a, a US facility, um, Chris mentioned there, there's one actually in Maryland uh, at the highest level uh, BSL. And it, you know, you think you're visiting uh, NASA when you visit that place, you know, every possible uh, super expensive, super sophisticated way of protecting people and things is at play there. It's sort of amazing to see, but that's something not a lot of countries can do. America can do it. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo cannot do that. All right. Well, we're gonna, there's endless coronavirus questions, but we're gonna take a little uh, turn here in our last few minutes, last 10 minutes. Um, real good intelligence wheelhouse question. How safe do you think our 2020 election is going to be based on, you know, Russian interference and who knows who else might be trying to interfere? So I, start with I'll jump on board and just say that there's significant awareness in the intelligence community. Obviously, it's been released to the public that there are concerns with the 2020 elections. So it is a significant concern. I can tell you that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Director Ray, is well aware of the threats. They have stood up a foreign interference task force, and I am very confident that they are tracking not just Russian activities, but as I said, and I alluded to with disinformation, they're tracking Chinese activities that are inimical to U.S. interests, that are against U.S. interests, as well as the Iranians, because it's not just the Russians that might interfere with our uh, electoral process. I think the, the broader issue is, again, the fact that states want to undermine our own confidence, the America's own confidence in its institutions. That's the broader issue. We're going to get through the 2020 elections and be able to assess whether they were attacked, how vulnerable were we, what was the result of the interference. There will be some interference. It's inevitable based on what we know happened in 2016. Uh, you should note that in February, also, this is available online. There was a national counterintelligence strategy that was published that acknowledges the threats to our very democracy. So it gets at 
the problem. And I am just sharing with you that some of the solutions are a task force that's been forged, that's come together to focus very aggressively on countering this threat to the election. But it happened in 2016. To some extent, it's going to happen in 2020. And along and coupled with the pandemic, it's going to cause some Americans to question our very institutions. And for those out there that want to disrupt the elections and want to um, really attack confidence in our institutions, that is their broader goal. And uh, we don't want them to succeed. So we will continue to, uh, to ensure that we counter those activities with the appropriate law enforcement and intelligence measures. Well, let me just add something to that. I, I, I have high, I am not reading the intelligence, although I'm seeing what's what's being sent made public. I have no question that the intelligence community has the capability to report on the FI, observe on the plans, intentions, and capabilities of our foreign adversaries, particularly Russia, but also Iran, probably China, a number of others, in terms of the election. Um, that's an intelligence problem. There's then a policy problem. Intelligence, as I said at the beginning, informs policy. So the intelligence community can tell policymakers, here's what the real world looks like. Um, here's what we think the secrets are. Here is what is happening. But it is not an intelligence problem to respond. Um, the intelligence community within the United States does not do anything to respond to things. The law enforcement community can. Rest of the policy, we can we can make some decisions. We can decide to spend money on X or not spend money or pass new laws or form a group that will do X, Y, and Z, uh, pass new uh, regulations. There are a lot of things we can do, but that's up to the policymakers. The best the intelligence community can do is give them the timely, accurate intelligence on what the adversaries are doing so they can make good decisions. Second issue is, Chris is exactly right. Uh, the, the Russian interference is a perfect example of an active measure. One element of it is to de decrease uh, confidence in our institutions. So we should expect, and I, I assume but don't know, that the intelligence community is, is reporting that, for instance, Russian disinformation will attempt to convince Americans that our, we can't trust our elections. So they will say things like there will be fraud or this won't work or um, you know, you should expect to see, you know, on your Facebook feed memes, if we go to mail-in voting, you'll probably see a lot of disinformation largely coming from overseas that's going to say, you know, it's all fraudulent. If there's mail-in, it's fraudulent. You can't trust your elections. Uh, if we don't do mail-in, you'll probably see the same thing. If, you, if there isn't mail-in, it's fraudulent and you can't trust your elections. The Russians have a real interest now uh, in, in uh, denigrating and diminishing our confidence in the very institutions that we normally are very confident in. Question is, how are our policymakers going to react to the that intelligence flow? By the way, same thing with coronavirus. Intelligence flow, what do you do? Two separate, very separate things. Um, and I, I have to say, I really love some of these short questions because I have to read them as we're we're talking. Here's a short one, but I'm interested in, they want to know, what is your takeaway from Cambridge Analytica? Go ahead, Steve, you got that one. <laughs> well, we have a new superpower, if you follow the Marvel world, um, the ability to manipulate and understand large amounts of data and the intersection of that with social media is a, a new superpower. Um, I'm not a big Marvel fan, but I think the phrase is, with great power comes great responsibility. I think Spider-Man said that. My, somebody will say that I'm wrong. It's not Spider-Man. I'm sorry. Um, Cambridge Analytica is an example of the, the what the technology is doing, which in many cases just makes our life much easier. So think, for instance, when you go to your physician, your physician now has your entire medical record right there it's much less likely that my doctor is going to give me the wrong medication or wait a week. So I'm going to get better care. Um, if I get hit by a bus outside my house, I'm not supposed to be outside my house. So if a bus hits my house and hurts me and I show up at Sibley Hospital, which is my hospital, 
Um, they're going to roll me in there and that physician in the ER is going to know a lot about me and they're going to know my allergies. And so I'm going to survive. And, and that's great. And our life is more convenient. Um, I, I can buy things easier. Um, I'm sitting at home buying stuff from Amazon right and left. And one of the ways they can make that happen and get it delivered is this large amounts of data which are being manipulated. It makes our life easier. And on the other hand, it's you know, Chris used the word double-edged sword. Uh, it can be used for nefarious purposes. It facilitates active measures. Cambridge Analytica appears to have, according to public reports, um, provided the capability to both know about how people, that's FI, and then actually allow probably the Russians to take action based on that and affect the world by changing their purchase of and targeting of ads and uh, communications on social media. It's a very, very valuable uh, piece of intelligence. I remember working on the project when I was at the agency and, you, and I distinctly remember thinking, I wish I knew how many people in a given country had satellite dishes. And that was a really big problem. How do we do that? And, you know, can we, you know, can we take pictures and then count the, the satellite dishes? And now I'm sure like, you know, probably a sixth grader could go online and, you know, tap a little bit and, you know, you could get a, a spreadsheet downloaded number of uh, satellites. And I'm sure Amazon knows exactly how many satellite dishes are wherever because they want to sell some more of them. So it, it's, an, it's an easier problem to solve, but lots of people who you may not want solving those problems can solve them. Yeah. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Chris? No, that's or? a comprehensive, excellent answer. I have nothing further to add. Well, well, this is, we have two minutes, so I'm going for a question that um, is tricky because of the topic, but it brings us back to the Spy Museum because someone wants to know how we handle at the Spy Museum the case of Edward Snowden. And so I want to think for a minute how wonderful it would be to be in our gallery, top secret, and look at our wonderful videos and displays. And uh, do you want to comment on that, Chris? I will just say we handle it like we handle all of the stories, very carefully and objectively. And we don't tell people what to think about Snowden. What we do is just offer in a very heady, interesting gallery, Secrets Revealed, you know, what the state knows, people who construe themselves as whistleblowers, others, uh, especially in the intelligence community, consider them traitors to their nation. We don't tell people at the Spy Museum what to think. We lay out part of that story, uh, the story of whistleblowers, how relevant that is now in the aftermath of the impeachment process this year. So we are timely, we are relevant, and we tell all of our stories, I think, carefully and factually, but we don't tell people what to think. We lay out the, the story objectively to include, we touch on Snowden along with some other stories that uh, relate to whistleblowers and we let the public walk away and think through, you know, what they just read, what they just saw. And I think that's pretty, pretty, uh, that's symbolic, if you will, of how we approach all of the tough stories that we lay out at the International Spy Museum. Do you have any thoughts, Steve? I know you're a huge fan of the museum. I am. I, I would just add, this goes back to what I said earlier, what we were both talking about, is we expect our visitors to the museum to act like intel analysts, unbiased, look at all the data, make your own analytic decisions, walk out of the museum knowing more and having strong and sometimes painful thoughts. There's no question about it. But um, the, the museum is in the business of, we're your collectors. Um, sometimes literally, we have an amazing collection of objects. Um, we collect stuff for you, we lay it out, and we expect our visitors to do the analysis. Um, that's the key to the museum, and that's the approach we take. Wow. Well, I, I like the way this conversation turned. We've had incredible information and conversation. I want to thank both of you tremendously 
it's tough to be on the spot um, just looking at your computer screen and, and thank you for being so candid and uh, sharing so much. I want to invite all of our online guests to come back next Thursday. We will be gathering here again online at noon. Um, we'll be doing one of our curator quarter programs and we'll be focusing on the uh, Notorious by Robert Hansen. And um, we'll be talking with Eric O'Neill, who uh, worked for him undercover as a young FBI um, staffer. And um, so we'll be looking at one of our galleries, Turncoats and Traders. So that's next Thursday at noon. If you'd like something a little lighter, if you want to take a break from the coronavirus, come back at 5.30 this evening for one of our happy hours. And we're gonna share some really incredible stories of animal spies. It is for, it's for adults, but kids are welcome too. We're gonna to have some great tales. Do you, yeah, do you know my bad joke? Yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Everyone be well, take care. See you Thank soon. you everyone. Thanks Bye. for having me. Thank you everyone.